I obviously have a job that requires a huge amount of emotional ups and downs, you know. There has to be an access to a deep trauma or a deep thing that you have to kind of keep going back to. Even if your body doesn't know that it's acting, it feels like it, you know, you put yourself through it. I wake up and I have morning depression, so I am just, every morning I go from the subconscious of dreaming to a feeling of being insanely down and I'm very moody in lots of ways. For a long time I tried to like avoid it by having sex or taking drugs or you know doing the things that kind of avoid the feeling and, that, and now I'm like looking at the feelings and once you've acknowledged them and see these are the patterns how do you feel but how do you kind of allow your brain to have some relief from those big mood dips and ups and downs. I think anxiety for me has been a pretty constant thing that I deal with. There's part of that anxiety that I like, you know, there's, there's information in it for me, but I would like to understand it more. I would like to understand what anxiety is and why, why it's happening. And when did it start? Uh, it was very unconscious for me as, as a kid and, and, as, a, and as an adolescent. Um, and I jumped into uh, drugs and alcohol very early. Like how early? 15. You know, stimulants as well. I didn't really like pop. I was into like amphetamine, cocaine, that kind of stuff. And it made me feel at peak more calm. Actually. Interesting. Yeah. Because your brain's actually a bit of the opposite of that. Right. Your brain, as we'll see in a little bit, okay. is really busy. Busy, yeah, yeah. That doesn't surprise me that you're telling me that. <laughs> I think we just leave it there, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I thought that was my brain. I was like, yes, it looks full. We look at your scan. You have a good cerebellum like that, sure. but the anxiety centers are up. You hurt your temporal lobes right here. Yeah. And that's why you have the darkness. Huh. And it could be, yes, the vulnerability in your family, right? Genetic vulnerability always people in your family struggle yeah. with their moods, yeah. then you're more likely, genes are in a descendence, what they are is a wake up call. Mm. It's like, oh, I have this in my family, therefore I need to take care of it. Mm. And then hitting soccer balls with your head and having some collisions, it's not a good combination. Yeah. You actually stopped me playing soccer for like six months where I was trying to play but then you said, you know, in your book, you were like, don't head the ball. So I just go around going, guys, I can't head her. All right, this isn't, I'm going to do everything other than the headering part. And they were like, well, you can't be on the team then because <laughs> it's a big part of this game. So how many concussions have you had? I've had th three major concussions. And what happened? I was on the, I went kind of was on the floor and someone basically just kicked me in the head. And then another was soccer again, in which I got kneed in the head. And then the most recent was two years ago. I like, I fell and I smashed this here and went to hospital for that. 
And that was on the left side? Yeah, that was here. Because the trouble is on the left side. Right here, where this hole is, you don't have holes in your brain. What it means is really low blood flow. Right. This is classically physical trauma right. pattern. You were already struggling before. Yeah. This just makes it worse. Right. And makes it harder, even when you think the right things. Yeah. To feel better. Yeah. You see the bumpiness? Okay. That's what I see in people who've had a substance. Really? History. Now, if I got you when you were actively using, yeah. it would have been much worse. Because yeah. you've been drug free for like 11 years, right? Alcohol free for 12 years almost, and somewhat drug free for about six. Because I do the somewhat. psychedelics. And we're, you know, that was part of my, has been part of my own development of into the into this subconscious and you have found psychedelics help i have yeah the reframe around how they've helped me see a more expansive perception of myself and the world it's removed fear for me around death and also forgiveness of self has become a lot easier when you see the madness you kind of put touch on this a little earlier where you can kind of zoom out and look at trauma look at the madness from a kind of objective point of view you're looking at your own self and going ah oh, that's why you're doing that oh, of course you're going to do that and forgive yourself for it it's it's helped with that bit a lot more but it doesn't fix you and we still have to do the work it's like yeah it's sort know, of my concern your emotional brain still is working way too hard so if somebody gave you a stimulant i would work because I've treated maybe 20,000 people with ADD over the years. Yeah. This is not a brain that's going to respond to that all. Right. And it looks like past trauma. Really? So if you look, connect these dots, it begins to look like a diamond. Mm -hmm. And I published a big study showing I could separate emotional trauma from physical trauma with high levels of accuracy. But the treatment's different. Yeah. You know, one, you have to calm the brain down, the other, you have repair it right. and stimulate it. For years, I want to calm down your emotional brain. One wonders, I wonder, if this might not be ancestral trauma, mm. that your mom was on the Guinness because her emotional brain was working too hard and she always felt it. Yeah. So she's trying to calm it down and she wants you to be perfect because that'll make her feel better about exactly. her. Exactly. Right? That stress got transmitted to you but from what I read, what your grandfather saw was truly horrific. Yeah. That in a plane accident, he saw someone decapitated. Well, his friend, when he when they landed at the airstrip, he went to, to see his friend, had, his friend's head fell off when he was 18. So it's before he's making babies. Yeah. And, he was yeah. alcoholic all his life from that moment. Now, does he come from people who are alcoholics? Or is there sure. a lot I don't, of I don't know. history in your family? I his never knew my granddad. He, both granddads died before I was born. Is there anything that, if you were a young man, this, look at this, do this, or, you know, is there something that you like prioritize? So I've thought about this a lot. And I used to, when people would ask me that question, what's the one thing I should do? Mm. I used to say, stop being stupid and do them all because it's your brain. Right. And then I realized, well, that's not helpful. <laughs> I like that one, actually. <laughs> we use that in the men's team. Stop yeah. being stupid. Yeah. <laughs> that is helpful. And then I thought, well, what is the one thing? And I was blessed to be able to work with BJ Fogg who is a professor at Stanford on how people change. And he said, you have to help them create tiny habits. So what's the smallest thing you can do today that will make the biggest difference? And we worked for six months and we came up with 50 tiny habits for the brain. But there's a mother habit. And the mother habit is as you go through your day, just ask yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? And if you can answer that question, 
with information and love, love of yourself, love of your family, love of your mission, you'll start making the right decision. And nobody cares about their brain. Mm. Why? You can't see it. You can see the wrinkles in your skin or the fat around your belly, and you can do something when you're unhappy with that. But what we did today is you got to see your brains. And I'm hoping you develop an emotional attachment to it. And you're like, I want this better. Do you see a difference between the female brain and the, and the male brain? Is there, is there a bit massive really? difference? Okay. I published a study on 46,000 scans looking at male brains versus female brains. And it's like we're not even the same species. Right. It's their brains are so much busier than male brains. And generally they're healthier because they have more estrogen and they don't do quite the toxic things that male brains do. Is that because they can develop a consequence Things like that, they, they understand consequence more than male brain, you know, the development of that thing is all part of it. Is so that... the prefrontal cortex, right? their prefrontal cortex was way more active, right? which actually why females make good leaders, their executive brain, their frontal lobes, mm. much more active than male brains. So they're often better at forethought, decision making and collaboration. Mm and empathy. And guys struggle with that. And then if you hit a lot of soccer balls with your head, you really struggle right. with it. Not consciously. So we're kind of almost like fighting different battles as men and women in the world. You know, we've, we've got a different set of cards that we're starting from. And is that an evolutionary developed thing? Well, it's either God's cruel yeah. trick or right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> evolution. You know, yeah. why is the female brain, their limbic brain is bigger than the male brain because they're primary caretakers for children. Right? Mm. Yeah. So it's almost like as men, we have to work a bit harder to get access mm. to some of those things that come a bit more naturally to women and, and probably vice versa, you know? We kind of have to know where we are not what are vulnerabilities. Exactly. This kind of primary idea of someone going out and doing these things and being the breadwinner or, you know, as these things are changing, I think we've got to work out how the brain is operating so that we can then kind of work out how to rewire this thing, you know? So I'm interested in knowing how to be more in control of that because I feel I'm very competitive and things like that. And I'm in that, in that kind of very, I'm trying to get more control over that stuff so that I can be a better member of society because it's clear that this being compulsive, being that, you know, is now it's, there are huge consequences to that now in a way that there weren't before in, for men, I think, you know, in some way. Last 10, 15 years. Right. It's changed dramatic. It's no good like labeling it morally bad. You know, it's like, okay, this, like you said, there are certain things that are just, we are gonna have to work harder at, you know, as men. And that's okay. It's and just, know what you know, your values are. Right. What you just said about the brain difference then, by the way, is very, very controversial, you saying that. And so, but we, we believe that too. And we're, we're, we, we, that's what I think you're saying there as an ally, yeah. because it's not about good, bad. It's right. about, let's look at the reality of something. And then we deal from there rather than say, no, no, no. It's all the same, so it, it's really actually. I just all... try not to pay attention. I know, haters. but that's listen. That, I get it, but like, but it's, we're in an industry. We're that both. Is, you can't yeah. do that. You know, that's the so that we're kind of trying to come. That's well, why I can I, give you the science papers. Yeah, yeah. I published. We that. could just do with those. Yeah, we'll just yeah, start yeah. handing them out. Yeah, just be like, look at this. Look at this.